In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, You who are everywhere present and fill all things, Treasury of all that is good, Master of life, come, dwell within us. Cleanse us from all stain and save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. We're going to reflect now on the Christmas Day Mass. First, I'm going to give some uh, general consideration to the way this mystery of the Incarnation is talked about in the New Testament and a little bit in the Old. Um, there's a rhythm. Divine existence, incarnation, heavenly existence. And you find this, it's the, the, it's the structure of the Gospel of John. But you find it, for instance, though he was in the form of God, this is uh, Philippians 2, uh, 6 to 11, though he was in the, he was in the form of God, morphi tu tegu, equal to God, did not be, deem being equal to God a thing to be clung to. So, he uh, emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being obedient, obedient unto death. That's the, therefore, Dio, uh, God exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. So that uh, at the name of Jesus, the name Jesus bears, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, on, under the earth, and every tongue confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, that is a divine attribute. It says in Isaiah, remember it's 45, 24, um, by myself I swear, this is uh, starting with 23, 45 of, of chapter 45, by myself I swear, uttering my just decree and my unalterable word, to me, Every knee shall bend. By me, every tongue shall swear, saying, Only in the Lord, in Adonai, are just deeds and power. You see? In other words, that's God claiming this. And that's what Paul attributes to Jesus. He's divine, Jesus. And that's... It's so hard for our minds to get that we forget it. But there are many texts like that. For instance, um, one we're going to look at soon in the letter to the Hebrews, through whom he also made the ages, who being the radiance of his glory and the imprint of his being, and sustaining all things by the word of his power, having brought about purification, purification of sins through his body. You see, sat down, now he's back in heaven, at the right hand of the majesty on high. Um, and so there are all these texts that um, speak of this rhythm of the incarnation you see uh, there's a, he's in heaven he comes to visit us and he returns to heaven but when he returns to heaven he returns with all that he acquired on earth a body also, the scars on his body, they're still there. He never renounces his passage among us. He's still the one. Uh, so, uh, now, as we're going to see, there are texts that grasp after this. Some of the great mystics of the Old Testament saw, as it were, the footprints of God. They, they couldn't quite especially in the wisdom literature. Uh, there were words used, but there were two words that um, were connected with God in a very particular way, word and wisdom. Uh, as the New T Old Testament describes these two terms, or these two realities, they somehow share in God's identity. That's as far as they can go. 
but it's a preparation. We have this text from the Book of Wisdom, for instance. Wisdom is mobile beyond all motion, and she penetrates and pervades all things by reason of her purity. For she is an aura of the might of God and a pure effusion of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, naught that is sullied enters into her. For she is the refulgence of eternal light, the spotless mirror of the power of God, the image of his goodness. You see how they're describing wisdom, which is one of these two words, hokma and dabar. Here's hokma. Well, um, uh, this, this text would be written in Greek, and so it would be Sophia. But you see, uh, they, they don't know how to say this, but their, their minds are being elevated and they're true to the tradition. It's funny, they, so they describe the wisdom of God or the word of God as somehow sharing God's identity. And that, putting it that way, I owe to a study um, by, um, I think I know it here someplace, uh, a very beautiful study. Uh, It'll probably come up later. Uh, you see, another one. This is 1 Timothy 3. Undeniably great is the mystery of godliness, Evsevias, who was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed to the Gentiles, believed in throughout the world. There you see that same rhythm, huh? being with God, coming to earth, and returning to God. Um, that makes this um, mystery of the Incarnation. There are many other texts, and we're going to be seeing some soon. The preparation of the Old Testament, oh, there are so many. The whole idea of who God is. The whole idea that He forgives us. That the Holy Spirit taught us be merciful to me, O God, you know. Uh, that's that psalm, the miserere. Hanini Elohim kahasdeka. Be merciful to me, Lord, according to your hesed. In the fullness of your mercy, blot out my sin. If you didn't know God, you wouldn't talk to him like that. You know, there's an intimacy, there's a sureness. You see? In fact... Once our Lord has become man, died, and risen from the dead, the Old Testament opens up. In Luke 24, Jesus shows them from the Scriptures that the Christ had to die and so enter his glory, and all those texts about himself, all the texts in the Old Testament about himself. There's no New Testament at all. Jesus is standing there, you know, three days after his death, talking to them. And so we have this reading. Now, uh, we also have a psalm. Um, here. Uh, but I'll wait. I'll first do the reading from Isaiah 52. And we'll start that now. And then uh, we'll have time to do the psalm when we get there. So we'll start the reading now. Ma Navu. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet or the footsteps of the Mubasar, Mubasar, uh, the one who brings good news, who makes heard shalom, the one who brings news of goodness, huh? who makes uh, salvation heard, who says to Sion, Your God reigns. Your God is king. Now it's this reason. Your God reigns. You see? Malak uh, Elohecha. You see? What is that? You see, that's the man who comes and says, now the kingdom of God is coming. You see? It's a blessing on the feet of the messenger. And the messenger is Jesus. You see? a blessing on the feet of the one who brings this good news. You see, that God, Adonai, has asserted his authority to save his people, to save the human race, 
And therefore, there is good news. And that's where we get the word gospel from, right? God spell good news. Uh, and then it's basar in, in Hebrew, huh? It's the good news. Try to think where we'd be without it. Try to think if you were brought up, say, in communist Russia or Nazi Germany, 40, 50, whatever, 60, 80 years ago, not a word about God. All around you, oppression, suspicion, imprisonment, torture, and not a word about God. Unless you belonged to a very devout family who spoke to you in whispers in the house about God. You see, what kind of idea of God would you have? If you saw it in your parents' eyes, if you saw it in your parents' life and smile, you'd be okay. But there'd be no practice. There'd be no going to school and hearing about God. You see? And so, that's what the, the Jews were waiting for this. And they're, they're in exile. And all of a sudden comes this, you see, Ma nawu el heharim ragleim mebaser mashmiya shalom mebaser to. This man is doing three things. Uh, the first one is uh, good news, huh? and then making known shalom, making heard shalom, and giving good news of good, making heard salvation, saying to Zion, Malach. Elohecha, your God is king. He runs everything. And he's come to intercede, to interact on your behalf. Think of it. That's getting the footprints, you see. They know that something's going to happen here. They don't know what. You see, uh, they're not sure. But they see this good news coming. Your God is king. Nothing can stop him from carrying out his will. And his will to bring salvation. That's what keeps people going. It just occurs to me of a story about Jews who are in a concentration camp. And at the Feast of Sukkot, the day after is the feast of Simchat Torah, the joy of the Torah. So the old rabbi said to everybody, God commands us to make merry on this day, so let's obey him. So they all began to sing and dance and praise God in the concentration camp. Now that's faith. That's faith. God told us to do this. This is the feast day, so let's do it. Isn't that beautiful? You see, faith, that's what this promise is. We know he's going to act. That's why when the Baptist comes, he picks up a theme that's already been at the Dead Sea with the monks, uh, a voice in the wilderness crying out, you see, prepare the way of the Lord. He's coming. He's coming. And so, uh, that's the, uh, the news the good news, beyond anything anybody could imagine. And these great saints and mystics who had a glimpse of this, um, somehow, who uh, spoke about the Dabar Adonai and about the Chokmah. Sirach 3, you poured your Chokmah, your wisdom, over the whole world. And that's why and it's that wisdom that holds things together. That's why, as we're going to see in the Gospel, John uses the word logos. Because it was already used by some of the Greek philosophers as that principle that holds the world together. But he says, in our he, in the beginning, in, ho logos, before, you know, the word already was. And we'll see that. <laughs> 